morning, everybody. I'm just going to check um, on the chat. I had plenty of people saying that the sound was okay. Um, anybody just want to um, put, post something in the chat just to say yes, you can still hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you, Kat. Yeah, great. Right, so um, welcome to Raising Investment for a Community Business. My name is uh, Mel Mills and um, I am Social Sector Engagement Director for Big Society Capital and um, I work with um, Luna on our work around um, good finance and also around um, raising awareness of social investment tax relief. Um, so I'm really delighted to have um, a great range of panellists with me um, this morning um, and um, I'm just going to take you through. Uh, we've got Jed and Naomi from Power to Change. Give us a wave, hopefully you can see them. Um, and we've got Chris from Plunkett Foundation. Great, so hopefully you can see him. Yeah, give us a wave, Chris, if you can see us. Yeah, great stuff. Um, I've introduced myself and Jason Nuttall from Crowdfunder um, is going to be joining us about quarter past 11. Um, so we're also going to use, everybody's on mute. We, we might have an opportunity for um, some questions and responses at the end with microphones, but um, I'd like to encourage you, if I can, to use the question and answer format in Zoom. Post questions that you have in there. We're going to leave questions to the end because we've got quite a lot to get through. But what I will do is make sure that we've got some time at the end and try and cover as many of those questions as we possibly can. Um, purpose of today um, is um, to talk a little bit about whether you're in the process of considering community business as an option, whether um, you're running a community business. Um, we wanted to give you an opportunity for um, to talk to us about some of the um, situations you might find yourself at the moment in, in terms of um, the crisis. Um, but also, um, I'll, I'll come back to you as a couple of people talking about um, the view. I'm sure it will switch over when I when I mute to myself. Um, um, but uh, we also wanted to make sure that um, you understand some of the range of finance and support options um, that are still available and the things that we're working on and considering in the background. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over um, to Jed and he's going to um, set us some context today. Just to give a bit of, as, as Mel says, a bit of background and context. Um, I think, rightly, one of the things that I'd probably, I'd probably start with today is, um, pointing everyone towards, bizarrely, um, perhaps whilst, perhaps not whilst we're on this webinar, you can wait until after. But the social investment business have done, uh, launched a data partnership with Tortoise Media. Um, and um, it's looking at um, basically uh, wallet spend in local areas. And they're trying to do a piece on how the social economy responds to that. And one of the things that comes out most of all from, uh, from, from some of the data piece that they're looking at is the, it's the local economic impact and local spend. And it's uh, around how impacted organizations that are um, reliant on footfall and, and local visits, how, how hard they, how, how they are gonna be impact very, you know, very harshly. I think that makes up a significant part of SIB's portfolio and our portfolio and others. But also one of the other significant things that I, that I think that, that comes out in that, in that piece is um, a real return to local money flows. So the reason I mention that is that we're, uh, in 2015, we were set up as an, an independent trust to support community businesses. And we were endowed by the National, uh, National Community Lottery Fund, as is now, not as was. And our, um, our aims is to create better places through community businesses. So um, if we just move on to the next slide, if that's all right, Luna. The reason I was sort of mentioning the local elements first is community business, speaking very, very broadly, a business is run by local uh, people with profits going directly back into the local community and the community that they serve. Um, we some of our investment has been into particular places so like a lot of funders nowadays we're, we're sort of interested in being a place-based funder so places like Wigan, Hartlepool, Plymouth, Bristol, Liverpool city region and focusing on how community businesses can trans transform places whether from grassroots or through city region and county-wide strategies but we're also investing uh, across the country and I think something that's quite important in terms of the community businesses that we try and invest in and, and sort of facilitate our money going to 
Um, 63% of our funding is awarded in the 30 areas that would be ranked sort of as the most deprived areas via IM, uh, deciles of uh, the indices, IMD um, deciles of uh, deprivation, which, um, so, I mean, it's quite an important part of some of the, what, what we're trying to address and where our funding is uh, structured and goes to. Um, but one of the things that we've also looked at is how we've pioneered and tailored our funding to meet to what we would see as the sector's distinctive needs. So whether that's by just providing grant or actually in some ways providing equity and blended finance um, is of as much interest to a lot of the organisations we work with. I think all organisations, as we all know, um, no matter where they are in their life cycle, uh, uh, need the capital capital and that capital to be affordable and one of the things that we're particularly interested in is how do you get the right sort of money to well to use the key to steal key funds terminology how do you get the right sort of money at the right sort of time on the right sort of terms to these organizations um so we've pioneered what uh, a program that naomi my colleague leads on um a fairly uh, distinctive uh, program looking at the looking at using community shares and since 2016 we've invested over 1.2 million pounds in community shares and most importantly alongside 5,000 individual investors investing in the stuff that matters to them in their own communities which has allowed to further 2.7 million for community businesses to use so it's trying to work on that basis of providing the the long-term patient cash that these organizations Need, need to use focusing on some of those communities biggest challenges um if we just move on to the next slide if that's all right luna the the key features that we we and this is again why i mentioned the really important data that's coming out from social investment business at the top of this four key features we'd look at when when we're talking about community businesses we talk about organizations being locally rooted so they're they're in a particular geographical place so they can respond to those areas particular needs in a in a much better and much more nuanced way than perhaps a sort of top-down funder might they're accountable to the local local community so i mean realistically i i think that community ownership is key here but accountability can be demonstrated in many ways so via participating membership ownership ownership the trustees being reflective of their local area um the crucial part i suppose in terms of taking on repayable money for us um and what what we're speaking about more broadly today is that they're trading for the trading for the benefit of the local community so it's it's businesses with a clear trading model which have services and products that they that they sell but um, it's you know they're, they're not for private profit. There's I suppose some of the some of the, the terminology that we'd use in the, the way that the profits are used is to deliver that wider local benefit. And they're trading for broad community impact in that they engage with a variety of groups in their community and they're able to demonstrate how they how by uh, selling um, their services and products how they benefit how they benefit the local community as a whole. Um, so from now until 2022 with obviously the increased focus we've got at the, at the moment um on on what will be a, a sort of covered emergency response we're hoping to help more communities in more urban areas and uh take ownership of land and buildings so that they've got more security and can deliver community benefit for years to come we're quite strange in that um, we're a spend down endowment um so when it's gone it's gone um, so I do think that gives us um, um, a lot of um, a chance to to go as to go quickly and do things that maybe others uh, wouldn't wouldn't be able to. So I think it's um, we're helping communities to access capital to purchase and develop their, bu their buildings and their assets by boosting community air share offers, match trading, and looking at social investments uh, as, as an option more broadly. I've had a private two-minute warning off Mel, so I'm going to stop now and pass on to uh, back to Mel and then on to Chris. But um, I'm sticking around. Naomi's probably your person to speak to about what we've been doing in some of our programmes, but I'll try and answer any questions as best I can. Right, lovely. Thanks very much, Jed. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Chris um, in the uh, uh, interest of time, and then we'll carry on. Live. There's lots of questions. I'm trying to answer some as we go, and we'll come back to many um, in the Q&A session. Over to you, Chris. Hi folks, you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, wave your hand if you can't. 
And Mel, can you give me a hand wave to let me know you can see it? Thank you, that's great. So uh, before we get started, I'm here representing the Plunkett Foundation for whom I work as an advisor. Um, and uh, what I really wanted to almost say is that, and it's kind of very relevant to where the Plunkett Foundation began, because it's just over 100 years old. Um, and what we found, you know, in the midst of all the negative around the COVID-19 crisis, there is an underlying positive, which is the huge upsurge in community engagement and people realizing that if they come together and work together, they can do something for their local community. So they just might be talking to other investors and other advisors, you know, at the end of all this, a bit of a bonus and appreciation of what communities can do. And that's particularly relevant to where Plunkett came from, because they actually found it 100 years ago by an Anglo-Irish uh, pioneer who just understood how cooperatives could work together. And he set up some of the first Irish cooperatives. And if you think of the Irish Republic or three stages, it would have been then uh, coming out of the, you know, the, the potato famine and everything else. You know, he really did build a sort of cooperative led community business from the very beginning. And Plunkett has carried on his work as a national charity since then. Um, now we work very closely with other partners, uh, organizations, and I'd probably just like to kind of echo Jed's words, really. Um, our business is to work with community businesses, predominantly in rural areas, but not exclusively, um, because the Plunkett Foundation involved in rural Ireland. Uh, but it's really about how do we grow the sector? How do we support more people, more communities setting up businesses that trade, that make money, that put the money back into the local community? And how do we help them get investment to do that? Um, uh, our whole ethos is about extending the relevance and reach we do. We have certain areas of specialization, which I'll cover in a minute, but we're much broader than that. And very much focused again to take one of the pillars that Jed referred to at Powder Change, very much very focused on making sure that we're measuring and understanding the social impact of the community business we have. And I'll illustrate that a little bit more as we go through. Uh, and very much what we do is we're a deliverer of programs and we create an enabling environment to enable community businesses to form. I think. Just uh, uh, Mel, in your in the uh, original um, uh, agenda, you said to talk about startup growth and then exit and closure. The good news is with community businesses, I put it more like this: it's startup growth and then consolidation. There's very little exit and very little closure. Um, over 95% of community shops that have been with us are still trading, compared with. 45% of average startup businesses. So there's a 95% survival rate. So, um, you know, it does go on to create a long term impact. So that's the Plunkett Foundation. And as I said, we've talked about how we grow, how we're focusing on growing the sector, extending our relevance and reach, social impact, and enabling environment. So that's the background. So, how do we actually deliver on all of this? Well, um, it's interesting, again, going back to COVID-19, all of these programs have suddenly become, you know, almost more important than they once were, because you might think that people are not in a position to start a new business in the current climate, but actually, we've been feeling a lot of inquiries from community groups that are starting to do things like deliver meals to hospitals, and they want a legal structure, they want some governance, they want to know how they can get funding, they want to know how they can consolidate the donations they're getting and run it and, and govern it appropriately. And we're already advising groups like that now. So the sort of things we do are very relevant. So we have an information and innovation hub, and you can see the website address that's there at the bottom of the screen. We run a wide variety of events, um, webinars like this to, uh, to help. And in fact, if I can make a shameless plug, uh, I'm hosting a webinar this time next week um basically to help community groups run their agms run their governance process where their rules may say they have to have a physical meeting how do they do it how do they consult members how do they deal with members who don't understand how to use zoom etc 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 so we're already working to help people in the current climate you know deliver a good service to their members and to their investors um, uh, 
we have an online membership forum for community business. It tends to be specialised. We've got a very good pub one, very active community pub one, a very active community shop one, lesser ones in the area of community woodland, other community assets. And as I said, we're very much a fun, you know a program manager. So we work, we administer a, rate, a range of grants and programs for organisations like Power to Change. Um, and I'll give you an, at the end an example of how we do this with the More Than the Pub program. And then we've got about 50 specialist advisors, of which I'm one. Uh, we really de delivered some tailored support, which I'll give you an example of in a moment. So that's how, how we deliver as a program provider. This is the sort of programs we do. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's more of a demand than ever for some of this uh, during the current crisis. So we talk about legal structures. So we'd sort of sit down with a, an unstructured community group and we talk about how they'd raise money. Um, how they might look at a share issue, how SITR or EIS as a tax relief might be an incentive for them, how they might use it. And we draw quite heavily on Big Society Capital's own webinars to point uh, groups at for specialist advice in this area. But we look at how they're managing their community engagement, funding, business planning, how they're going to measure social impact. Many of them understand this impact they have, but they have no concept of how they might record it uh, and articulate it to uh, grant providers and to investors. We advise on employment matters um, and ongoing business management. And we run, as I said, a various network support groups for, for members, which are actually brilliant. I mean, uh, I sit on a couple of them. And the Community Shops Network is, you know, if, you, if somebody's got an obscure question about an electronic electronic point of sale system one question will get about 10 answers within a day from other groups looking to help each other so that self-help concept kind of goes right back to Horace Plunkett 100 years ago you know people working together are just much more effective so that's what we do um, so what are we doing during COVID-19 to say there's a few specialist areas we've had to work on that we didn't have to do particularly before but one of the big issues in rural supply chains is you know, at the risk of sounding a little political for a moment, organisations like uh, Tesco, who control the single biggest wholesaler, you know, have no doubt deprived that said wholesaler um, of stock. And it's been quite difficult when you've got a community, a rural community, as I live in, thousand people where elderly population is all self-isolating. The community shop is their hub and getting supplies has is, is been... Uh, I'd say a challenge to say the least. So Plunkett have done a great job. They've got MPs writing to government uh, uh, to, to lobby the government and make sure that uh, yeah that, that our voice is being heard and we do understand that yeah you know, it's being addressed. So um, yeah, that's one thing we do. We're sharing knowledge around how you handle the crisis, like the webinar example I gave you. We're working with partner organisations like How to Change. Um, like locality, like Co-ops UK, to basically deliver on, um, you know, on on the programs we want to su su provide. So, um, so it's basically all the resources we had are being tailored now to sort of allow groups to work and adapt. Not just necessarily firefighting to react, but also to, in some cases, and we'll say a little bit more about this, community pubs where they're actually sitting there saying, well we're shut down or we can't buy it, everything's ground to a halt. Perfect time to do planning, perfect time to plan a share offer or what have you. So there's a lot, a lot of work on that. So, so in the interest of time, let's talk about community pubs because this is, um, this is almost like a model program that illustrates what we do. Uh, but we have other parallel programs that are designed to do similar things to develop the sector, as Jed said earlier. So there's over 100 community pubs in the pipeline um, in the UK now. There's more than 150 in the pipeline. And we've actually got on our books over 200 groups who've actually expressed an interest in how they might acquire a local community pub and are at various stages in the process. It's grown by 30%, as it says. We've encouraged uh, over 2,000 uh, organisations to register their local pubs as assets of community value, which gives a level of protection. Um, again, a bit of background, 80% of them, the groups ultimately go on to own, 20% they lease on long-term lease, 65% um, are managed and 35% are tenants. That's interesting because 
there's some nuances with SITR around tenant versus management. And basically with a tenant pub, it's pretty impossible to get SITR relief because um, you're effectively leasing the business. But a lot are managed. SITR is equally appropriate to that. And they create employment. A fair proportion of them use volunteers in their work. And basically, it's been a bit of a success story. And as we speak today, none have failed. Uh, and there's probably the oldest one goes back to the 90s. So, you know, a this real success. Give you a two minute warning, okay? So, so what is the More Than The Pub programme? It's, it's a comprehensive end-to-end -end support. Um, it is uh, sadly now suspended to new applicants. But as I said, there's about 50 actively working through the programme now. Uh, so there's a lot of, if you like, backlog that we work through. And obviously, there's a hope that the programme will reopen. And it is a mixture of learning events and peer networking. I like webinars. Those eagle-eyed among you will spot the pub in the background is one of the pioneers. It's the Angler's Rest in Bamford, which also has a cafe and a post office as well as a pub. So the more than a pub element kind of comes across. It's a community hub that happens to be a pub as opposed to a pub that does a bit on the side. Um, bursary funding. Um, of up to two and a half thousand is available. And this goes hand in hand with business development advice. And this is the sort of work I do a lot of, uh, covering the things we described earlier, like legal structures and governance, uh, fundraising, investment, community shares and the like. And perhaps the bit that's closest to what Jed talked about is this blended finance area. We work with the key fund, the cooperative and community finance, and that gives a loan and a grant of up to a hundred thousand. So anybody who's investing in community shares knows that 100,000 is already in the bank when they invest. And that's usually the thing that makes the difference in getting the, the pub successfully acquired and the business started. Um, a case study I'll point you out before I finish. Uh, the, web, the web address, note the spelling of Crawford, crawfordarms.com in Maidenhead, urban pub, uh, not in a particular area of rural deprivation, but not in sort of ritzy part of Maidenhead either. Real community asset and a good example of where they did use SITR to raise the funding they needed to acquire the pub. So hopefully, uh, Melanie, I'm within my two minute warning. Um, I feel like an American footballer now. Um, and I will hand back to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chris. That's great. Um, so now you've got some ideas and some context about, you know, what community business is, if you didn't already know why um, it's more and more popular um, in terms of communities taking control and um, certainly some great contents there about, um, you know, perhaps some of the opportunities for the future around local purchasing. So I'm going to, um, we've also talked a lot about support um, through Plunkett. So I'm just going to come back now to um, what, now you've got the ideas, you've accessed some support, you've got a plan. What about when you need um, some money? And I'm just going to um, hand back over to Naomi um, and then we're going to welcome Jason to talk. So over to you, Naomi. Thanks, Mel. Um, great. I'm going to try and start my video, but there we go. If my computer system slows, I might switch it off. So let me know if I go. Um, OK, so sort of uh, following on from Jed and from um, Chris there, I just sort of give you a brief overview of our programmes. I'm not going to talk too much of them in detail at the moment because, as you may be aware, our Power to Change uh, grant programmes are paused at present while we focus on our emergency response to support the community business sector with the impact of COVID-19. Um, so what I'll do is I'll do a bit of a quick tour through them. Um, our programmes are designed to support community businesses at different life stages. So um we have our bright ideas fund which is a support program for community groups uh, and organizations at early stage of development who want to become a community business and want to have local social impact so um applicants uh, successful applicants could get one-to-one -one business support from an advisor um uh, appointed by locality or our main delivery partner but we do work with plunkett and co-ops uk um on the program and there's also an opportunity for a small grant within that program as well so um, as guess Chris sort of has mentioned with Plunkett, the way that we work is we work a lot with delivery partners. As Jed said, we are a run, spend down charitable trust. So that idea is we want to work uh, as close as possible with existing delivery partners who are already out there doing a lot of good stuff. So that's how we're working with them. 
And so similarly with Trade Up programme, um, we work with the School for Social Entrepreneurs, um, which have schools across um, England. And um, Trade Up um, provides very much about um, uh, sort of mentoring and action learning sets, a lot of lots and lots of peer support um, within those schools for people who are at sort of early -ish sort of stage of development of their community business. Um, so people can come along and do a lot of face-to-face -face interaction, a lot of online stuff together as well. So, um, and then again, there's access to um, some grant support around a traded match program. So as you hit trading targets, we match that as well, up to £10,000. So um, that's how that program works. So there's a common theme throughout all our programs. It's not just about money. It's not just about grant. We're very much about trying to do some um, business development support alongside that and really um, yeah, add value where we can. Um, community business fund is our most popular fund by far um, it supports um, uh, community businesses who are already sort of established um, with grants between £50,000 up to £300,000 and this is about helping them progress more towards self-sufficiency so about really helping improve their viability and that could be through traded income increasing that securing an asset or significantly reducing revenue costs um, the Community Shares Booster Programme is one which is very close to my heart, uh, as Luna and Mel know. <laughs> so I often come out and about talk about Community Shares Booster Programme. Um, so that's where we provide development grants to up to £10,000 to support community businesses with developing a community share offer, meeting uh, standards of good practice, um, developing their business model, their business plan, which we hope will get published alongside their share offer. And then we also, so again, not about grant, it's around um, uh, equity investment. We match pound for pound up to £100,000 in community share offers, provided that their community business can hit their minimum target. So that feels, it's a great programme. We love that. We're doing a bit of equity there. It's a bit different. It's a good little bit of patient finance. If you want to know more about this and any of the other programmes, there's more details on our programmes page. Uh, Chris has very handily, helpfully already talked about more than a pub, so that's good. Our Homes and Community Hands programme is um, a programme which is about supporting communities to develop their own housing solutions to deliver affordable homes for local people. Um, so we, we sort of have some geographic targets around that, around Bristol, Leeds City region and other areas across the country as well. So um, Liverpool City region, Leeds City region. Tees Valley City region, west of England and West Midlands. So we have a bit of a focus on that, but we are interested to hear from innovative community-led projects across England. So um, bear that in mind. So we do, as you can see, have some sort of open sort of funds, which are, are kind of very broad for around different, uh, different community businesses across different sectors. We have some specialist programmes like the More Than a Pub, the housing. We are also interested in um, community energy and uh, community businesses focusing on health and social care as well. So the best way to keep up to date with the programmes is to look on our website where all the data information will be. And if you're not already signed up to the Power to Change newsletter, that has actually recently just gone weekly um, to try and provide lots of information um, as part of the kind of response um, to support community businesses who have been affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. So that's just something um, to, uh, yeah, focus on. We're doing all sorts, putting lots of comms out there about practical resources to help people, links into the government and um, support measures. We've got a policy update on the homepage as well, um, as well as lobbying the government with our partners for support to the sector. So there's a range of information. We've done some webinars as well as everyone's doing webinars at the moment. So there's a, the most recent one we did was all about e-commerce. So if people looking to try and get more uh, information about how do they actually move some of their uh, business online and some really practical sort of support on the latest webinar from that. Um, what else do I want to cover? So yeah, I'll give you an example as well. So Friends of Stretford Public Hall based in Manchester is a grade two listed public hall. Um, this local people, the build, count, building was shut by the local authority, the community came together, wanted to take it into community ownership and um, they received £10,000 development grant from the Community Shares Booster Programme to work on their business plan and share offer. They then went ahead and raised uh, about £150,000 through their share offer, uh, which was matched pound up to 100 k from uh, Power to Change. Um, and it was a really good one that because it was they had a minimum I think you could pay I think the minimum was 100 pounds but you could pay in 25 pounds 
every sort of month or so to create to hit the minimum to make it really inclusive um, and so they're busy um, refurbing the hall the building is, is open for business they have like well-being Tuesdays in there so they really are maximizing the space for community benefit so that's probably quite quick isn't it so uh, I suppose what I should say in terms of our programs they are paused at the moment if you have got a live application in with us um, best to do is to contact your your, your main contact you've had already through through email contact if you're not sure who your delivery partner is for the program again visit our programs page um, to find out more there'll be direct link to the contact details on there but i'll i'll shut up and okay. to you thank you naomi we've had a couple of questions actually about some of those things so we'll definitely come back to those um i'm going to hand over now um to jason Mitchell from crowd funder um uh, we've talked a lot again about this is all great in terms of a rich tapestry in terms of um, yeah how you get going here the support the grant programs and now let's talk about how crowdfunding can play its part in community business. Thanks, you, Melanie. Yeah, we're off. Um, okay, I've actually got a few slides, so I will try and share my screen. Uh, this one. I can't see if that's sharing. Is that sharing? Great, thanks, Melanie. Um, so at Crowdfunder, we have been working on a response to the crisis around a campaign we're calling Pay It Forward. Um, we launched that very soon after um, we went into to lockdown, um, where we noticed um, an influx of businesses immediately impacted by the crisis, particularly hubs, bars, restaurants, cafes, who, who lost trade, um, overnight um, and it was before any of the, the government um, schemes were announced as well. Um, so to date, up to now, in the last three weeks, we've had three million pounds raised through um, Pay It Forward for different businesses. Uh, we've got about 900 different businesses live at the moment um, and heading for 100,000 people who've supported different projects on the platform. Um, there's a selection of them um, on the left there. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those as we go through. Um, what we're doing is um, helping businesses by um, engaging their, their customer base, um, their supporters through the crisis, and where possible, um, getting businesses to offer their services, their products, et cetera, um, as rewards that people can then claim once the crisis is over and we're out of lockdown. Uh, we're working with a range of partners, so Enterprise Nation are a partner with us on the, on the project. They're offering business support and advice. We're also working with uh, Rio, the, the Real Ideas organization, um, to do similar as well, particularly around creative industries. Um, if you want to see, look at the platform, it's crowdfunder.co.uk forward slash pay hyphen it forward, uh, pay hyphen it hyphen forward. Um, so, as I said, what we're doing is asking businesses to offer a range of products and services at different price points that can be delivered or redeemed after lockdown. In the case of charities, it might not necessarily be that they offer an actual service to the individual who's, who's pledging the money. It could be that you're offering um, for £30, you support a food parcel to be delivered to a, um, a family that needs it or for £50 you're offering um, a session of debt advice, counselling, whatever it might be. It doesn't necessarily have to be an actual physical thing that people get. Um, a lot of them can be also experiences as well and, and things that people you know, can look forward to af after this um, current weird state we're in is over. Um, a great example I thought would be the Ivy House, the first community owned pub um, in the UK. Uh, they recently launched their crowdfunding campaign with us. Um, it's in Nunhead in London for anyone that doesn't know the Ivy House. Uh, so this is a new campaign. They've had 84 supporters so far. They've raised £3,000. They're looking to raise a total of £8,000. In terms of what they're offering as rewards, um, there's a range of different things. So, so we kind of split rewards into four kind of categories. 
products and services, experiences and events, sponsorship and memberships and thank yous. Um, everybody should be thanked for their reward, um, uh, for their pledge, for the money that they donate. Um, and you can do that in different ways. You could offer a handwritten note, a handwritten postcard, whatever that might be, for say £20 as well. I thought some of these are quite interesting. So obviously it's a pub. So if you pledge £40 of more, you'll get a £30 bar tab. So I think the idea there is, you know, there's a £10 donation, you'll get £30 of, of bar uh, of food or drink when the crisis is over. Um, but you know your money's going, going to help the pub stay alive. Um, those kind of things tend to work quite well. And obviously the cost to the business is much lower than £30. The cost to the business is generally um, the, uh, in effect, the raw materials, the beer or the food. Um, and often what we find is where if you've got a voucher for a, um, a product like that, so like a restaurant, cafe kind of bar, uh, restaurant or cafe or pub, often if people have got a meal for two or a voucher like that, they will go in with friends. They'll go, oh, we've got 30 pounds to spend. You know, why don't we take some friends? We'll split the cost. Or they'll say the meal's paid for, so let's have a dessert and let's have a bottle of champagne. Make it a bit more special because you've forgotten you've spent that money already. Uh, some other ones they're offering, which are quite nice. So the, the 45 pound ticket to the reopening party is looking quite popular. 13 people have pledged on that. Get a glass of fizz, some finger food when it's all reopened. Um, a big one there for £800, a private party for up to 50 guests. Um, those kind of rewards, although they, you know, that might be quite, seem quite a difficult sell, if you can get two people to, to pledge on that and, and buy that, where if it's someone's 50th or you know, 40th wedding party, whatever it might be coming up, um, they might be more than happy to, to do that. Um, I've put one there under sponsorships and memberships. It's not really a sponsorship or a membership, but I thought that was quite an interesting one. Pledge £10 um, to donate really some money um, towards the workers who are struggling to make ends meet. So that's just a nice way of getting... What we're seeing is a lot of businesses are actually getting donations from people. You wouldn't normally think of donating money to a business, but we're certainly seeing that at Crowdfunder at the moment. People really want to see their local businesses open when we're out of this, so are willing to, to donate money. And I certainly think these kind of rewards that are being offered here, when push comes to shove, a lot of people won't actually claim their rewards. They'll just go, do you know what? That's fine, you keep my money. I've done similar with a couple of businesses in Brighton that I pledged on rewards for meals. I've just dropped them an email to say, I'm not never gonna claim my meal, just, just keep my money. I'd be more than happy just to be able to come in and have a meal when you're open that I pay for. Um, another example is, is a um, Save Craving Coffee in Tottenham. It's not a community business. Um, again, they're offering things like masterclasses, a coffee boom masterclass, uh, £10 for a postcard, coffee and cake, um, and lots of different rewards that they're offering there as well. They've got a £1,000 reward. I thought it was interesting to see someone has pledged a £1,000 uh, to get 20% off for a year um, and a, a, a dinner and your name on the wall of fame. So, you know, there are people pledging large amounts to businesses out there. How does it work? What are we offering? Well, the way it works is you put a project on the website and it magically gets funded. Alas, not. But there are so many people who think that how, do think that is how crowdfunding works. Sadly, it's a little bit more involved than that, but we can help you through every step of the process. Um, we ask you for some basic details. Tell us things about you, the name of the business, who you are, etc. The second step is, is really telling your story. What makes your business special? Um, tell a nice story to the customers. Use um, recent photos, particularly photos with people, people enjoying the business, being um, supported through the charity or, or whatever it is you do. Um, think about some great rewards that you can offer. And like say, if you don't have services or products that you deliver to people, um, that, that you can give to people, are there services that you deliver that you could package up in a way that people can say, well, I'll pledge 10 pounds. I know that's gonna support um, a volunteer's travel expenses or pledge 50 pounds and I'll support a two hour debt advice workshop. 
You need to add payment details and bank account details and get all those verified. Once you've done that, you're pretty much ready to go live. And the next step is the really crucial one. It's about how then do you share that with your network? Crowdfunding always starts with your close network. Get them to support you. Um, and once they've supported you, start going out to the wider public. Use it as an opportunity to talk about what you do, to engage people in the work you're doing. Um, what we usually find is that um, when organisations crowdfund, often around a third of the people who pledge to the project have never heard of that organisation before. So we know it's a way that businesses can go out there um, and, and market what they're doing, even at these times when things are quite difficult. Um, we'll ask you to, to either raise money on an all or nothing basis or a flexible funding basis. Most people would go, well, why on earth would I risk not getting any money by, by using an all or nothing funding method? The answer is because you will raise more money it creates a much stronger narrative that with the public if you say we need to raise five thousand pounds by the end of the month to do this thing um, and if we don't raise five thousand pounds we won't get a penny that all creates a really strong narrative with people that helps them make the decision to give and and give now um, you need to think carefully about your target set a target that's realistic start mapping out your network, who are your supporters, where are they, how much they might need, um, and always start with your target as the minimum you need to make whatever it is you want to do happen. Um, I would say when at Crowdfund, we always get people to think about a very specific project or thing you want to do. And even if that's uh, like the Ivy House, raising money to keep itself going, make sure you're clearly articulating why you need that 8,000 pounds. What is that money actually gonna cover? Um, and what might happen if you don't raise that amount so it's nice and clear. At the moment, we're not charging any fees for projects that are raising money in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there are no uh, platform fees and no transaction fees either. Uh, we will ask the people pledging to projects to leave what we call a tip to cover our services, um, but it's free for you to run a crowdfunding campaign, you'll get every penny of the money that you raise. Um, if you're a registered charity, you can also claim gift aid on the money raised as well. And um, the money is paid over within seven working days of the close of the project, usually before that. Um, so you'll get sightline of the cash and the cash relatively quicker, uh, quickly after the project closes. Um, I think I mentioned a few of these, but through the crowdfunding process, we always find that people get other benefits. It's not just about the money. And I will always say to, to people thinking about crowdfunding, if you're going into crowdfunding just for the cash, you're missing the point really of what crowdfunding is about. It's a chance to go out and engage with your network, to check with them. Um, you know, do they like what you're doing? Um, can they give you feedback on that? And when anyone pledges to your project, we ask them to leave a comment and over 50% of people will, will leave usually a really positive comment about what you're doing, how they might want to be involved, things they might be able to offer as well. Um, it's also a great way to raise awareness and, and build a body of advocates around your, your project. You're building a network of people who really care about what you do and want to see you successful. Um, we've also at the moment got lots of additional funding coming through the platform so we're talking to all the local enterprise partnerships across the country um, Solent have been the first one they've put up six hundred thousand pounds of match funding for businesses um, the northeast lep are hot on their heels they're putting up a million pounds of match funding for projects businesses in the northeast um, and we're talking to a number of others um, we're currently working with Sport England to set up a match fund for sports projects. They're putting a million pounds to support sports projects and organisations across the country as well. Um, so all that funding will be flagged up to you when you start setting up um, a project on the platform. I'm also really keen to speak to any funders who want to work with us to match fund businesses, social enterprises, etc. through the platform. Um, please do get in touch with me. We're also free for funders. So for any funder that wants to match fund projects through the platform, we've dropped our fees on the funder side as well throughout the crisis. 
Um, and lastly, just to say, we've got lots of help and advice. Uh, we can help you get started. We've got a great crowdfunding guide. Um, we've got coaches who can help you. We're running regular accelerator groups. Um, today, we are showcasing our new um, online crowdfunding course that people can work through in their own time with loads of help and advice. Um, once you start setting up your project, you'll get tailored emails. We know where you are in the process and we'll give you tips and advice um, to get you going. You also get loads of great feedback through the platform as well to tell you how your project's progressing, um, where's traffic coming from to your project um, to help you really work out which bits of marketing are working, do more of those if it's working, um, which bits aren't working, have a look at why, why they aren't working as well. Um, so loads of advice and support for you if you want to um, give it a try. Um, and that's all I was going to cover. Is that um, I think I've done that within my time, Melanie. Yeah, you have, Jason. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank great. You. Thank you. That's super. Um, I'm just going to try and round up because I'm conscious that there's an awful lot of questions that I really want to get to. Um, so I am just going to try and give you, if you stop sharing your screen for me, that's brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So hopefully you can see my slides now. So I'm just going to give you a very, very quick um, brief overview for you, uh, around social investment tax relief, which has been um, mentioned by um, a number of um, our panellists. Um, and I suppose essentially here what SITR is, is an additional option if you are raising um, investment um, and it can wrap around both um, community shares. So um, that is a form of equity and also um, you can use it on loans. Um, in terms of the key facets of social investment tax relief, um, it's unsecured, um, which basically means it's the highest form of risk um, debt that potentially can have, or it, it ranks right at the very bottom. So investors are taking a risk when they make that investment. It's part of the reason why they get a 30% um, tax break. Um, it's very flexible. Um, there are a couple of questions around um, the cost of finance, which we'll come back to. Um, and the great thing about social investment tax relief is when you're um, negotiating with your investors about what return they will take, it's very much about what your investors will accept. And we've seen a very broad range of um, interest rates and including actually quite some interesting ones, sort of quite akin, Jason, to the um, rewards where people have been offered maybe um, a couple of different options of um, interest and quite interestingly, often people will take the lower um, rate of interest. Um, because they probably care either about the local issue or the geography. Um, something that's talked about a lot is patient capital. Um, basically means that um, most community businesses need time um, or to get started and get things before they can actually return some income. So one of the facets of social investment tax relief is that it, you can't repay um, the principal sum for a minimum of, of three years and one day, but there's no reason it has to be that. It can be longer than that as well. Um, and yes, that's where the reason that HMRC, alongside some other tax reliefs, which again you've heard reference like um, SEIS and EIS, um, the investor is offered a 30% tax relief by HMRC. If you want to know any more about the different types of tax reliefs, we have actually have a, a simple guide which outlines all the different tax reliefs, uh, what the investor gets, who can apply for them, and, and the cap key facets so you can compare and contrast one against the other. Um, in terms of uh, raising finance using SITR, um, there are three ways that potentially that you can uh, do that. So you can raise money through what looks like um, a fund or a fund manager. These are dedicated funds. Um, I suppose the um, benefit or the upside is they go and find the investors for you um, and uh, they will help you with the advanced assurance and doing due diligence. Um, but essentially, um, there's probably not as much opportunity around um, controlling the, the cost because some of those are already um, agreed. Um, you can use a platform like Crowdfunder or um, a range of other platforms that are available, um, either peer-to-peer -peer lending or crowdfunding. Um, and this is where it becomes um, not donation or rewards based, but where it works as a, a repayable finance option. Um, I think uh, what's particularly interesting in these very difficult times is that um, community shares um, offer potentially their most or one of the most patient forms of capital 
Um, so whilst um, SITR has that three years built in, I know as a community share owner myself, um, it's not something that I'm looking to cash in or trade out. So um, there are additional options there. And then the third form is what we have to call um, direct or DIY, which is where essentially you don't work through a platform or um, a fund manager. You go and find the investors yourself, um, set up the, the loan facility. And again, we have a, a DIY guide to how you do that with just a little bit of a caveat um, that if you are going to go and do this, it's not something you can just go out and, and start emailing about because this would become potentially a financial promotion. And again, we have a nice simple guide. Um, I say it's a simple guide to financial promotions. When I first came to the sector, it just sounded something sounded like it was something very expensive to me that you'd have to pay a lot of legal advice for. But I know it's simple because I can read this guide and understand it myself. Um, so um, all of these things that I've talked about, and actually I've got a couple of questions which I'm going to come to, um, are all available on our micro site, which is called getsitr.org.uk. It includes lots of case studies, lots of guides, lots of the webinars that actually have been talked about. Um, also has quite a lot of templates. We've got one on advanced assurance that I'm going to come to. A database of all the SITR deals, and yes, more than uh, a couple of the examples that I saw, actually a couple that popped up on Crowdfunder, alongside the ones that um, have been quoted both by uh, Naomi and Chris, um, are also um, uh, ones that were on our database of SITR deals. Um, we are still actively involved in um, lobbying government. Um, this uh, SITR has a uh, uh, an end date at the moment of March next year and we're still lobbying in the background very hard um, obviously against a background of far more pressing priorities to see that we can make sure that this um, way of raising patient more affordable capital can still be available to eligible social enterprises and charities as we move forward. So um, I'm conscious that I want to leave as much time as possible for questions and we have um, plenty in the Q&A, which I'm going to um, try and come to. I think some of the panellists have been answering some of the questions um, in a public capacity, um, so you may be able um, to come to those. But the one that there's been lots on, and I'm not sure whether um, Jed or Naomi you want to go to, because there's, there's several questions, let's see if we can just wrap this up for everybody, is um, potentially why are your programmes paused? When might they be reopened? And there are a couple of people um, have some specific questions. Is there any guidance that you can give to the people that are on and then if not we'll try and um, look at how else we might be able to support and help them? Uh, I think Naomi's had to, had to go. So I'll, okay, I'll good. Um, they were paused in response to, well I think not, not really knowing what the situation is or how long it's going to last for or in the best way that we can respond to, to, um, to help organisations in the space. Um, when will they reopen? Uh, I'd, we're probably way too early in at the minute to, to guess, um, so I wouldn't want to guess. So uh, if you keep a look at the website, um, then there is um, there's a, a blog from our CEO, Vidya Alexson, about um, why, the whys and wherewithals, and link it, and now he's put a link to funding sources at the, in the Zoom chat there. Great, lovely, thank you, Jed. Um, but I think um, it was Nigel had a couple of questions um, specifically around funding and support for technology-based solutions. Um, uh, Nigel, we have um, produced a um, COVID-19 resources hub on good finance, which um, I will make sure is included in our follow-up notes. And we are posting every new um, uh, funding source that we can find. I will also consult with my colleagues to see if there's anything specifically that I can um, find uh, that might support. I can see technology-based ones, but it doesn't look like it. They will do the sorts of things that you're looking to do. They tend to be focused on a particular um, uh, issue or isolation rather than um, the, the sorts of things you've described. So um, I'll definitely pick that one up um, separately, but also um, uh, try and include some further resources and links afterwards. Um, thanks, Jed. Um, can I just come to, um, there was a, a question actually, um, I don't know whether uh, Jed wants to take it or Chris, um, you want to uh, come to this and it was around the more than a pub um, and I'm, I'm definitely worth to, um, willing to put some, my two pen of women around the cost of finance um, and why the cost of finance is at 8% which um, um, 
you know, is considered to be high. So just one of you wants to take that and then I'll just come in and talk about, uh, you know, the cost of finance yeah. mm -hmm. Chris has answered yeah, it I'm first, yeah. and then so I'll, I'll follow on after Chris has. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so, so I've kind of posted Phil uh, Harris and Hans. I know Phil, so and he knows me, so um, uh, I'll perhaps be a bit more personal. Than that. But I mean, you know, on the face of it, it looks high, but it is unsecured. Um, and Jed, in fairness, is probably going to give a bit more detail than I can give. And it does sit alongside a, a grant. So, you know, in real terms, somebody said to you, even in today's climate, for a startup business that's, you know, by definition, because it attracts potentially attracts tax relief, is deemed to be risky. That you can have a, you know, that you can have a loan, an unsecured loan, effectively funding of four percent. Most people, most sort of, if you like, commercial entrepreneurs, would feel that was a pretty good deal. Um, but that said, eight percent as a headline figure is quite high. So uh, you know, it's probably ultimately, Jed, you may have a bit more to add than I have. But you know, I, 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 if I was advising a group, I'd say, you know. It's not that bad, guys. Would you really want to put your own house on the line to save 2%? <laughs> Actually, Jed, do you want to come in there or do you want me to pick up on... Yeah, I mean, broadly, Mel, the way I'd start from this as well is always looking from the perspective of the end user organisation as well. So rather than try to justify why money costs money, it's sort of looking around what the end user wants. One of the things that we've been particularly interested in it power to change is how do you do that right type of capital mix so in in the more than a pub program that chris is talking about it's that mix of uh grant debt and equity and i think that's a, that can be a really nice mix for for the groups you know there's not enough grants to go around the debt can be quite expensive it's quite tough to raise equity but if you've got a bit of all it's sort of the, and they're all contingent on one another it works quite well. I think in, in the other the other one that I'd say is in terms of the in, in in particular in terms of the money that Key Fund and the likes of CCF and a lot of other the of the financial intermediaries put out in this space. You know, the Key Fund uh, they're what they'd call in the states a lender of last resort. You know, they're lending to organisations that other people wouldn't. And I think there's a sort of a point in there that the headline figures that some of the mainstream banks put out that they lend at and not the actual figures that they would lend to organizations in the social economy at. So it sometimes feels a bit weird. Key fund and CCF can be very transparent, look can suffer for their transparency. And then others can say, oh, well, we'll do a deal at three, but then actually if you came down to it, they either wouldn't do it or would do it a lot more. Um, and it's, you know, CCF and Key Fund, the other thing that I think we, we should speak about a lot more with them is that they are themselves non-profits, you know, they're also within the social economy. So there's no one's getting paid um, interest on any uh, on any investments that they might hold within key fund, and there's certainly no you know big bank of dividends or any 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 nasty business like that. You know they exist as essentially infrastructure bodies to support the to support the social economy. Money can be there. Shop around if you can get it cheaper, get it cheaper. Yep, um, I would I would back. I mean I get asked this question all the time about the cost of finance. Um, I think. You know um, I, I would back up everything that's been said, and, and we would definitely. Um, say the same thing so if um, you can get the money cheaper um, uh, we don't say that the banks are bad and if you have a good relationship with your bank and they will lend to you and they can lend to you cheaper then please do look at that I think you do need to get into the detail because often the numbers you hear on the surface aren't the numbers that um, the sort of high risk unsecured lending will go to um, interestingly enough that um, it's probably things that are blended capital. So that's sort of subsidized part grant, part loan that we've talked about, and also social investment tax relief that probably offer um, alongside a definitely community shares, which might use you know, um, SITR as a wraparound, that offer probably some of the most competitive um, ways to borrow money. Um, and then there's a whole range of stuff. So you know, I have seen um, some of the SITR um, uh, loans right down at sort of 1.34 percent um i've also seen them on average up at the sort of between six and eight and a half through a sort of fund-based structure um but i think as you say when you consider the the level of risk um and, and the default rate um i know when i started in the sector um five years ago almost five years ago um uh, the average cost of um unsecured um borrowing for this sector was probably somewhere between 12 and 18 percent um, there's been a lot of movement, but it is um, around the risks, but um, I would definitely say um, have a look at what's available. Um, if you want to explore 
um, beyond um, community shares, the full range of um, social investors um, that are available, you can find them on goodfinance.org.uk. So um, definitely check those out. Um, we've had a lot of the questions that have been answered. There's one question particularly um, from Mandy Young around um, furloughing. Um, it's a really good question, Mandy. We've been doing quite a lot of work on this and I'm not sure of the answer either. So I'm gonna take that one offline if that's okay. See if I can find out a more definitive answer and um, come back to you. I'm also gonna endeavor just to pick up a couple of the um, quick SITR ones. Um, so in terms of um, RHMRC still able to cover SITR given the pressure on COVID-19 initiatives, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to. Um, uh, there may be a further delay in getting um, applications through, but I guess um, just generally the amount of um, investment raising, um, you know, isn't as high as it was before. I haven't had any indication so far, and I usually get people emailing me um, if they think that, um, you know, they've got an advanced assurance that's held up. So if anybody has examples of those and they are held up, do let me know, and I'll certainly ask the questions of HMRC. So yes, they should still be able um, to consider advanced assurance. And uh, somebody else asked a question about um, uh, making an online um, application for uh, advanced assurance. Um, and we do actually have some editable templates, ones for uh, each type of the um, eligible governance structures, which I've posted um, a link to. So you can find those on getsitr.org. So um, they were um, prepared by our resident SITR legal tax expert so um hopefully um, that can help um right um let's just go back to some more um questions that we have here some of the open ones um did i hear that um agents of those current time yet on the existing sitr yes there's a sunset clause at the moment that runs till um the end of the tax year so march 2021 but um we're working hard on trying to make sure that that gets extended um, and certainly if you sign up to the newsletter on um, getsitr.org.uk we'll make sure that you know that but there's no reason why you can't raise money and your investors aren't going to lose money if the scheme is completed and you have received the investment before the end of the tax year it will still be um, relevant. Um, I'm scrolling through um, are all funds Marguerite let's ask are all funds oops uh, what's my question? Um, Siobhan says, we are a uh, community benefit society looking to buy a building uh, listed as a community asset finance, even through CCF is too high for our business model. We have a share offer which raised £150,000. We are wondering if we can offer bonds ourselves and will they attract SITR or not? Um, what I would say is with quite a few specific SITR questions, we still have um, potential to have um, three SITR um, surgeries with our um, tax expert. So what I would ask is if anybody has a specific SITR question relevant to their individual organisation, if you'd like to contact Luna or I offline and we'll see if we can actually um, answer some of those questions for you. Um, is any uh, one of the panelists, while I'm flicking through, is there um, anybody else, any other panelists, anything that they want to share um, publicly from a question that they've answered? Jason, I noticed there are a couple around um, the listing um, of the pay it forward and also a couple of things around the uh, business as usual stuff. I don't know whether you want to share that more widely. Well, can I just start, do one from Siobhan on... Yes. The, um, the, so if the share offer has been successful and raised 150,000, if you did a, is, is the question if you did, if you did a bond offer on top of that, could you also put SITR against that 150,000, which I think, I think that's the question, um, as right. I say, I probably would want to take that one to a bit yeah. more detail, but Siobhan, if that's, if, if, if you want to, take line, Siobhan, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll help pick up on that. The answer, I think, I think the answer is no. Um, if it's building re building related anyway, but pick it up offline. As you say, it does depend on whether um, you've already got SITR insurance and what you're going to actually do with the building. 
Um, again, on um, getsrtr.org.uk, we actually have some guidance notes on um, the eligible trades and also particularly around the use of buildings, whether you're licensing or leasing them, um, or whether you're going to, it might be considered as property development, but it's say, um, either Jed will be happy to take that one offline or um, I'm certainly um, happy to do that as well. Um, okay, what other questions? Sorry, um, Jason, was there anything you wanted to come in and add from the questions that you've had that you wanted to share more publicly? Sorry, um, I've been responding to a few as I've gone through. Um, somebody asked what, what we normally charge business as usual. We normally charge 3% plus VAT for crowdfunding um, for the platform and um, transaction fees work out to around 2%. So it's average around 5 or 6% that you'd pay normally. Um, there's someone asking about startup funding. Well, we've got a great program um, for female entrepreneurs setting up businesses uh, called Back Her Business. It's funded by NatWest. Um, they're putting a million pounds of funding into um, female-led business startups. That's Back Her Business. If you just Google Back Her Business, you will find information about that program. Really great program. Get crowdfunding towards your business and get match um, from NatWest. Um, it's really easy to access and loads of support. Um, I can't remember what any of the other questions were. Um, no, I think, I think was a, there, was a, there was definitely one technical one, I think, just around um, how to put gift aid in, but I think you've... Um... Yeah, there's one around gift aid. You, you can claim gift aid. Um, it looks like they missed that option when they were setting that up, but they can turn that on by editing the dashboard. I've, I've dropped Mandy a line about that, but we can help if needed. Okay. They can do that themselves in their dashboard. Okay, that's lovely. Well, one, I thought one particular interesting question that Chris has answered as well, which came from um, came from Rob Wick on the survival rate. Uh, yes. Survival rate of pubs and survival rate of community shops in comparison to their contemporaries in the non-community owned space, which is you know, 95, 96% and 100 100-ish percent, is it Chris in the in pubs? pubs? Yeah, in pubs, which are obviously a more useful sector you might have. I think, I think generally, you know, without wanting to sound glib about it, and I think Chris has answered it in a much more measured way, there's no definitive answer, and, you know, Chris has got a lot more business expertise than I have um, going back, but they're, they're, it's one of those things that I think you can apply to in terms of the cash part in particular, because obviously everything's got its different business model and different legal form and everything else. But without wanting to sound too glib about it, there is a harder to start, harder to kill element to um, to a lot of community businesses and a lot of social enterprises, which, you know, it's very tough to get over the, that initial startup phase. But one, once they're there, they tend to be a lot more resilient. And we see that in the cooperative sector as well. And we see it in the in, in social enterprises um, that they're... they're ride over the first five years is quite tough but once they've made it there they they tend to they tend to stick around and i think a lot of that is having the right sort of patient understanding cash um is you know is really crucial um you know the reason a lot of startups would probably fail is you know greedy extracted money that um that runs away at the first sight of of danger so um so although this stuff can seem very techy and boring i think it is actually very fundamental to the the survival rate of of the startups and and something we should we should definitely focus on a lot more um a small plug but it's you know it's free resources the power to change research institute publishes more data than i can keep up with um you know and big <laughs> Capital's got all layers on there, which looks at looks at a lot of this stuff, and it actually does some sector analysis as well. So it will, you know, if you're looking at a multi-use hub or as quite a few people looking at shops and pub startup here, speak to people, speak to Plunkett because they know all about this stuff. Speak to advisors like Chris, but also have a look at some of the resources, which give you useful benchmarks about where you're setting stuff out, and it's you know it's aggregated information from hundreds of other organisations. So I think that stuff. The, the stuff that's really good about the social economy is that it doesn't try and monetize any of that. It just sort of throws it out there for everyone to look at and use. And I think that's that's great. You know, it's the way that we should use data in this space to, to help each other. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Jed. Um, I have another question as well. I, I saw on here that Chris answered from Mal um, about um, a pub and professional tenants and leasing um, and qualification for SITR. Um, there are, again, uh, as Chris said, really, the devil is in the detail. 
Um, there's um, a community pub that I know that has switched um, both from um, tenanted to take on, um, particularly as a result of um, COVID-19. There's also some things you can do in terms of how much of trading is allowed to fall as um, that Neil would say into the naughty bucket. Um, so it, it does very much depend. I don't think it's a straightforward black and white yes or no. Um, it would need to be um, have more um, detail look at it, but certainly something again we'd be prepared to pick up and chat with you about afterwards. Um, I just wanted to come back and there's a question from um, uh, Carol. Um, uh, Carol and I know each other well um, around some of the sort of place based response um, and also um, the balance, I suppose, between um, support for registered charities and um, support for social enterprises um, more widely. Um, so um, uh, I, I note that, you know, the place based response um, is quite varied, actually, and there was some seems to be some really uh, joined up thinking going on in the Greater Manchester area and um, perhaps that isn't being adopted by all places. Um, anyone of um, uh, the panel want to comment on this? I've been asked this question quite a few times recently about, you know, will the focus on um, place um, change um, because of the crisis? Will it become uh, more important um, because of the response of communities? Or, um, you know, will it be um, the last big thing that I suppose gets subsumed by the current crisis? Anybody want to come in on the sort of importance of place? The answer is no. <laughs> I think Jed should come in on that. One. <laughs> Chris, is when you nominate one of your panel members. <laughs> but just, I know it's very close to the heart of how to change it. I mean, I've yeah. been on the other side of the argument where somebody has been a sort of, if you like, community of interest that haven't been eligible for funding because they're not locally rooted. It is a genuine debate. I don't think it'll change the power to change. Because that's not what they're about. But, but it is an interesting debate. So again, I think, I, I, I thought um, someone's mentioned a lot of the mutual aid responses that are cropping up all over the place. I thought Dan Gregory's wrote a very interesting, Dan Gregory from Social Enterprise UK, the policy yeah. person. You know, again, he's much more sort of cerebral mind than mine and more articulate, but he wrote a very interesting piece about what, what we might see coming out of the back of this and why, you know, that, that sort of, uh, that community response. I think one of the main reasons we're always interested in place and specific, you know, place-based stuff rather than community of interest, I think as Chris is touching on it, is that I think community, you know, as, as being quite a different funder, um, communities are always best placed to answer the issues that affect them, not people, not people outside that community, I think is probably one of the, one of the things that we sort of predicated some of our um, focus on in terms of answering society and communities, uh, some of the challenges that, 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 that they face. Um, there does seem to be a real race towards place-based funding, but one of the things that I, one of the things that I've been most interested in, in terms of, um, in particular, the work that we've done in Bristol and in Liverpool, it's how others get behind uh, funders. It might, sometimes funders have to move first, so. It's, I always might have seen in Liverpool and Bristol, the local authorities have, have committed to follow on with, with money potentially um, to put out into the local social economy with uh, alongside power to change and other local partners. So, um, so that, you know, that place-based uh, response is, um, is, yeah, we're advocating for a national community business movement, but one that works on a sort of local basis, which means you have to bring partners in. Um, so uh, yeah, and then Luke, give the big up to the CB mutual aid bo uh, box, which is the, the more national response and, and localized answers. But um, yeah, it's probably a bit too much to answer in three minutes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Jed. Oh, we're nearly out of time, so I thought I would just um, round up really with a couple of things, which is that um, uh, a couple of questions around um, you know um, trading and the reliance on trading and just appetite to take on, on loans or any kind of repayable finance at this time. I think that's something um, all of us um, feel. We know that um, sort of uh, now more than ever, um, repayable finance might not be the answer and, and grants may, may be the option that is required. And I know it's why all of us were, were part of the lobbying government for the aid package, but as always, there won't be enough money to go around. Um, and I think it is also worth considering that there are some businesses actually 
um, where there is more demand for their services um, and actually um, you know they are being able to trade I'm, I'm sure that's a minority but there are some good stories out there as well some positive stories so um, a couple of things that I would say um, first of all um, in terms of emergency finance there are some funders that are open for business now in terms of um, the grant funders which we publish on good finance on the coronavirus um, dedicated hub and we've also introduced a new um, emergency finance um, icon um, on our social investor directory which is um, an orange exclamation mark. We are listing on there the very recently announced um, recovery and resilience loan fund that social investment business is leading on which is suitable for organisations that need um, bridging um, finance for cash flow when they're clear where the um, income is coming from and also the Community Investment Enterprise Fund, which is um, led through community development finance institutions. Um, alongside that, um, there's a whole raft of work going on around and um, trying to design what the next uh, raft of community uh, emergency finance should be. And Good Finance will be putting out a call for um, your input and information. There's lots of great stuff that we will take away from today. And I suppose, lastly, the other thing that um, we um, have been um, you know, all thinking about, and I think it, crowdfunding was a great reminder today um, of whether we're investors into um, community shares. I know uh, many people like myself, I'm thinking about um, all the money that I'm saving in terms of not buying um, coffee and um, not getting my hair cut. Any, any, I think I am one of those people on YouTube, you know, looking and working out how I'm going to actually manage to do that um, and trying to find a way just to um, use um, personal donations in this time to help out some of those um, organisations that are um, uh, personally important to us. So I just wanted to round up by um, thanking all of um, the panellists. Um, thank you Chris, Jason, Jed and Naomi retrospectively. Um, uh, we had some great questions and great answers. We're going to try and catch that. Um, a couple of people asked me were we going to ask for feedback on the webinar? Yes of course we definitely will. Um, so we will send you a very short survey afterwards. We'll also, um, any of the resources and um, slides we'll look to share with you um, with the panelists permission and um, any of those specific individual questions either for the panelists where they offer to answer them I'll just check that you're happy to share your contact details um, and any SITR specific questions then please do drop Luna and I a note um, and we will try and help you via our get SITR campaign otherwise than that um, not too bad 1231 we just about did it um, just um, uh, a big thank you to everybody and uh, I'll be one of the thank you very much.